So yes, so, so thanks to Ed for this introduction. I'm going to be talking about um, scalable inference of phylogenetic networks. Uh, I am in the Department of Plant Pathology, but my background is statistics, and I have been developing developing methods for um, reconstructing phylogenetic networks for, for a little bit. And uh, first, just at the notion, what do I mean when I say phylogenetic network? And I believe that we are all here familiar with the concept of a phylogenetic tree. But if not, I can tell you briefly that is this graphical structure that represents the evolutionary relationship of certain groups. So let's ignore for a second this green arrow. And then we have a tree here in black where we have internal nodes that represent ancestral species. I'm hoping that people can see my cursor. Um, I'm pointing them right now. Um, they are ancestral species that um, e evolved at some point in the past into the diversity that we see today. What I want to say or emphasize today is that the network is simply an extension of the tree model. So we have an underlying tree structure, but we also have certain edges extra edges that we add here in, in green that uh, represent any form of gene flow. So this green arrow represents that some ancestral population of these um, yellow fish uh, shared some genes into the blue fish lineage. And you, you'll see that I'm a statistician because I call them yellow and blue fish instead of the real name of this fish. Um, this green arrow represents any form of reticulation. So it could be horizontal gene transfer, hybridization, introgression, migration, we are all representing them the same mathematically with, with this graph. And one interesting or one, one point that I want to highlight is that um, this is, of course, a simplification of reality. Just as we do not expect speciation to be instantaneous, which is what a binary tree represents, so there is one lineage and then at one point instantaneously becomes two separate lineages, we are, we are perfectly comfortable with that simplification and with that assumption. It is the same for the network. So we, we put one arrow, but that does not mean there is just one event of one gene that gets transferred. So this arrow can represent millions of years of, of gene flow or, or a migration of, of a huge chunk of population. It's a simplification the way that we put it, but it's not saying that it's just a simple, um, simple transfer of, of, of one, one time point. Um, just one time point in the past. Okay, that being said, uh, the network allow us to have other type of interpretations by including these reticulation events. And I wanna also mention that there are different classes of networks that you will see in literature. So there is the explicit kind here on the left that um, is the one that I just described. So it has a tree, underlying tree structure. It has internal nodes that represents ancestral species. It has a time progression from the root to the present time, so they are directed networks. And aside from branch lengths, we have this extra numerical parameter here labeled 17%, that is the inheritance probability, the probability of getting gene transferred through this horizontal edge. Well, I, we say horizontal, even though it's not horizontal right now, this, this horizontal path. This is an explicit network and it does have a biological interpretation. The implicit networks are also called split networks, um, they are no longer interpretable. So even if you have an outgroup, for example, you cannot root them. They are completely um, undirected. All the internal nodes, they also lose interpretation. So they are not speciation events or hybridization events. They are just, mesh they're just uh, visualizing these coordinates, all these um, parallel edges. And the reason why I think people still use them a lot in literature is because split networks are very fast to be reconstructed unlike explicit networks that take a lot of time and a lot more data to reconstruct them. Uh, the bulk of my work uh, is uh, on methods to reconstruct explicit networks. So the ones here on the left, which I think are worth the cost, even though they are more computationally intensive, you do get a graph that you can interpret in biological terms. Okay, so how do we reconstruct the network? So we assume that we have, um, in this case, I'm showing the picture where these um, um, gray rectangles represent whole genomes, but you don't need to have whole genomes. You do, just need to have multiple loci. So in your data, we have um, these regions that are orthologs and recombination free. We'll call them genes or coalescent genes. They do not need to be protein coding genes. Uh, they can be any region in the genome that where you assume that there's no recombination inside this window 
and that they are orthodox. But people just traditionally call them genes. And then from your genes or your, or your loci, you want to estimate what's called the gene trees. So for each of these windows, you get a, a tree. And there are different um, tools to do this tree estimation. I'm not going to be talking about tree estimation, just network estimation. But the first step is to do the, the estimation of the gene trees. And one thing to notice is that these gene trees, they do not need to match. So even though they all come from the same evolutionary history, because we have these four species that we are studying, uh, the gene trees can be different. And in fact, um, it is widely known that gene trees can be discordant with each other. And there are many reasons why the gene trees can be different. So it could be estimation error, or it could be incomplete linear sorting or gene flow that cause all these gene trees to be different from each other. And ideally, we would like a method that accounts for all these different sources of variability into the reconstruction of the species evolutionary history. If we assume that this evolutionary history is well represented with a tree, then we can use a tree method like Bucky or Astra. But if on the contrary, we suspect that there is a potential of gene flow or hybridization in the organisms under study, then you, you should better use a network method, not a tree method. And there are many network methods out there I'm going to focus today on uh, SNAC, which is the one that I created with Cecilia Ne um, in 2016. But just so that I'm not completely super biased, I also wanted to tell you about the other network methods that exist in case you want to check them out as well. Like I said, <clears throat> the traditional path is to do from the genomes, estimating gene trees, and then from gene trees, estimating an explicit network. You can do this with SNAC that I'm going to describe today. But also with Phylonet. Phylonet is a very widely used tool that you can take um, gene trees as input and estimate um, explicit network. There are other tools that actually go the direct path, directly from the sequences to an explicit network. So this is just one step. <clears throat> and these are BIS2 or Phylonet. This, this path, this uh, purple path, is actually is, is very accurate because it's co-estimating the gene trees at the same time as the explicit network. So this would be the most accurate path. But because it's a very heavy computation, um, this is not scalable. So if you want to do from sequences, you want to go from sequences to explicit network in just one step, you need to have a very small sample size. So you need to have few genes, uh, maybe um, three or four species, very simple networks. Uh, if you have larger data sets, then you really need to do the two steps, what's called the two steps approaches where you first reconstruct gene trees, and then from gene trees, you reconstruct um, the network. And just to highlight a little bit of what's happening inside these methods, both BEAST2 and Phylonet, the ones that go directly from the sequences into the network, they're both Bayesian approaches. Uh, the likelihood is the same that's shared. It's uh, built on the substitution model for the evolution of sequences on gene trees and on the multi-species coalescence for the evolution of gene trees under the network. The, the thing that the difference between these two um, software is the prior, the prior of the network. The case of BEAST, this is a process-based prior, which is, is an extension to the birth and death process, where you have the birth is representing uh, speciation events and death representing extinctions. This is a very common prior for the case of trees. Uh, BEAST extended this prior to uh, allowing two lineages to also join back into hybridization events. So it's a process-based uh, prior. You can calculate the, the density of any, any network with this, with this prior. Um, on the other hand, Phylonet is, is a different prior. It imposes a prior on the number of reticulations that the network can have, and also the cycle diameter, because a reticulation event creates a cycle, or called, sometimes called a blob, in the network, I will talk more about this in future slides, but we are trying to control this cycle for it not being really large, and that's what Phylonet is controlling with its prior. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, when we want to estimate first gene trees and then the network, um, Phylonet has the two flavors, has the Bayesian version and the likelihood version, uh, which are both more scalable than going directly from sequences, but still not very scalable for large data sets which is why we created SNAC. SNAC uh, summarized the gene trees into some concordance factors. I will talk about that in the next slide. 
to estimate to estimate the network. Of all these options, the SNAC is the one that is the most scalable for big data sets. And all of these methods are building on the multi-species coalescent model, which just as a quick reminder, I, I was not sure of the, um, the, the, the background of people in the audience, whether people are familiar with the multi-species coalescent model, but um, just as a quick recap, if you have a species tree and you want to calculate the probability of a gene tree within the species tree, that is built on the coalescent model that it's actually it's calculating probabilities of having two lineages a and b coalescing or reaching a common ancestor in a window of time t and with the coalescent model we can calculate like i said the probability of any gene tree and i'm going to skip the details of this formula because we don't really need it um, but the the, the 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 message is simply that with a species tree uh, with the multi-species coalescent model, we can calculate the probability of any gene tree being within the branches of the species tree. And we're going to extend that idea to the case to the case of networks, because we know that the fact that these two lineages, A and B, they, they can coalesce in the window when they have to, and then we will observe the gene tree that matches the species tree. Or maybe they don't coalesce, like the one in the center, a and B don't coalesce in their window where they have to. And then by random chance, B coalesces with C before coalescing A. So then we would observe the gene tree that put B and C closer together. This is a gene tree that disagrees with the species tree. And then there's another gene tree that disagrees with the species tree if A coalesces with C. But this is just like random sorting of lineages within the branches of the species tree. So there is some positive probability that we will observe gene trees that are different from the species tree. We, like I said, we extend the same idea to the case of networks. The only difference now in a network is that we have this extra path for the B lineage. So the lineage that is coming from B, it has a choice. When it reaches the hybridization node, it has a choice. So it can follow the green path here to the right with probability gamma and then join the population with C, or you can continue on the same tree path, the, the standard path with probability one minus gamma. So we have gamma on one side, one minus gamma on the other side. But other than that, in the tree branches, once they it finds another lineage from A, this is the same probabilities that we have from trees. So it turns out that to calculate probabilities of gene trees, any gene tree, given the network with the multi-species coalescent model, it simply becomes a weighted average of probabilities of trees. So with probability one minus gamma, we have one probability for not coalescing in this branch. And with probability gamma, we see the, the other option. Like I said, I'm ignoring the probabilities. We don't really need them for this talk. But the point that I want to make is that the multi-species coalescent model on a network is building on the coalescent model on a tree, if you're familiar with it. And we now have just this extra parameter gamma that is giving some lineages the choice of going to one side or, or, or to the other. Okay, so SNAC is also building on the multi-species coalescent model, but it's not a true likelihood model. SNAC is a pseudo likelihood estimation. Uh, we take as data collection of gene trees, we estimate an explicit network, but instead of calculating the likelihood of the network as a whole, we break it up into quartets. So if you focus, for example, on the network here on the bottom uh, left corner, this has uh, six tips. Um, we could calculate the likelihood of the whole network, but we're not gonna do that. That's very time consuming. So we just extract four of them and calculate the likelihood of only four tips. That is one of the quartets. And then we pick another four, we calculate the likelihood of these four, that's another quartet. So we repeat this process, we extract all subsets of four from the big network, and then we multiply all the likelihoods. Uh, that makes SNAC a lot, a lot more scalable because you are only calculating likelihoods of small networks that have only four leads, so that's faster, and then you just multiply them. So because the networks, the, the quartets, I'm sorry, the quartets are not really independent because if you see they, they're sharing edges, so we, really they're not independent. So multiplying the likelihoods does not produce a true likelihood. That's why it's called a pseudo likelihood approach. Anyway, 
Uh, SNAC stands for Species Networks Applying Quartets because we are dividing by quartets. And we implemented SNAC as one of the functions within this Philo Networks Julia package. So we created this Philo Networks Julia package and uh, SNAC is one of the functions. We have many other functions for phylogenetic networks, so I encourage you to check it out. It's completely open source, as Ed was saying. Uh, I'm really passionate about open source. So it's open source and it's publicly available, so it, anyone can go see, can see it code. And what, another thing that I like to say when I reach this slide is if you have not tried uh, Julia, I also encourage you to, to, to do it. It's, um, for, for me, that I'm not, I'm not a computer scientist, so it made it really easy for me to do code that was fast and efficient uh, without, I, I would have I, I would have had to do this in C++ for it to be scalable and that, um, I mean, it's, it's a little beyond my, my expertise. So Julia, because it's a high level language, is very easy to program and it, the code, the resulting code is fast. So that's what I like about it. Okay, um, other things that I like about Snack, so I told you originally it is very scalable, it's more scalable than Pilonet and other options, but also it has, it's very robust to errors because we don't need to root the gene trees. So traditionally, the other network methods will require that you root the gene trees. Uh, we don't need any roots. So we, we are protected for rooting errors. Uh, we also don't take any branch links in the gene trees. So that also protects um, SNAG from uh, molecular clock assumptions. And lastly, we don't take the gene trees directly as input. Um, we summarize their information into what's called concordance factors. Depending on how the summary is being made, uh, this process can account for estimation error. So one of the criticisms from these two-step approaches is that, well, you're taking the gene trees as perfectly known, and that's not true because you estimated them. And, and that is a very valid concern uh, for SNAC because we are estimating concordance factors from the gene trees. This process uh, can account for estimation error in the gene trees. So, um, just to tell you a little bit about what I mean by concordance factors, let's pretend that the one, the five trees on the top are my five gene trees, and now I'm drawing them unrooted because I just told you they don't have to be rooted. So these are unrooted gene trees. Um, the concordance factors are simply some numbers that represent the proportion of genes having the quartet in the tree. So my original data set, whoops, my original data set has five taxa, A, B, C, D, E. And I need to, like I said, it's a quartet-based inference. So I need to focus on four taxa at a time. So let's just focus on the A, B, C, D. For A, B, C, D, there are three possible quartets, unrooted quartets. The one that has A and B together, so the split A, B, C, D, the very first one here on the bottom, bottom left. Um, on the center, we have the A, C, B, D. And then on the right, we have the A, D, BC. So these are the three possible options when we have this tag for taxa A, B, C, D. And now I go back to my original gene trees and I count how many times I see the split A, B on one side and then C, D on the other. And I color that here in, in like orange. Um, so it has one, it, three, three out of five gene trees have the A, B, C, D uh, split. So that this is the concordance factor for this split. Now, for the AC, there's only one, so that's a one out of five. And for the AD, there's only one, one out of five. So instead of having the gene trees as, as, as my input, the input for SNAC are really these three numbers. So I convert my data set into the observed concordance factors. So I list here all possible four taxon subsets. Each four taxon subset has three concordance factors because I told you there are just three ways in which I can arrange four taxa into one rooted quartet, and then I evaluate them from the concordance factors, but, uh, from the gene trees, sorry. So the pseudo likelihood becomes now this function that is balancing or comparing the observed concordance factors from the data to what I would expect the concordance factors to be from probabilities under the coalescent model that they come from an inferred network. And these expected concordance factors um, they come from the probabilities that I mentioned under the coalescent model. And these are just numbers, they are fixed. So for a given network, if I give you a network with branch lengths and gamma probabilities, 
you can define the set of all the concordance factors, the, the ones that you would expect by, by the, the coalescent model. And then it's just a matter of comparing what you observe from your data and what you expect to see from the network. And then we are searching the space of networks until we find the network whose expected concordance factors are closer, uh, closer to the observed concordance factors. And it turns out that doing this divide and conquer approach, it is a lot more scalable. So this is just a comparison with Phylonet, the, the two-steps approach of Phylonet. So Phylonet is also taking gene trees as input, and it, but Phylonet in this case is doing the true likelihood approach. So evaluating likelihood on the whole network. These panels, each panel represents a network of increasing size, where N stands for the number of leaves, and age is the number of gene flow events. So the smallest one has six leaves and one hybridization event. The largest one has 15 leaves, uh, three hybridization events. So it's not even that gigantic, the network. It has 15 leaves. Well, uh, we have two lines here, the one on top, uh, and measuring time, running times. So, so first notice that the, the top row is measuring time in minutes, and the one is measuring time, the, the one below measuring time in hours. So uh, Phylonet, so for example, the, the largest network with 15 um, taxa, we could not run it in Phylonet anymore. So the largest data set that we could run in Phylonet was with 10, 10 taxa, two hybridization events, and 100 genes. So SNAC was able to run cases where Phylonet, and, and this is the, um, was the, the, the most scalable version at the time um, for, for Phylonet. So SNAC was able to run larger data sets than the, the, the state-of-the-art uh, network reconstructions. Um, and also, the other thing is that the, the time for SNAC is very, uh, it doesn't grow as we increase the number of genes. Because I, as I showed you before, uh, the number of genes is hidden within the concordance factors. So really, it doesn't matter if you have 10 or 3,000 genes, um, you're just using that to estimate the concordance factors. Once you have the concordance factors, then this time does not does not increase at all. And we do see then the, the second question. So first question is scalability. The second question is, well, it is faster, but is it really accurate? And of course, the likelihood, the true likelihood will always be more accurate than the pseudo likelihood. That is always the case because the pseudo likelihood is approximating the likelihood. So it will be not as accurate. But the question is not whether it is uh, more accurate than the likelihood that will never be, but is it still accurate for, for the reconstruction of networks? And it turns out that it is under certain conditions. And this was very interesting. So here, for example, we have three colors. Uh, white bars represent the proportion of times that we're reconstructing the correct network and the correct direction of the hybrid edges. Um, and you will see for smaller networks, you see a lot of white, we are very happy. These are accuracy for just SNAC. I'm not comparing to Phylonet anymore. As you increase the um, complexity of the network, you will see that this white bar is decreasing. So that's expected. It's harder to reconstruct larger networks. But then we saw something very strange. For example, if you focus here on the bottom row, third column, so network with 10 leaves, two hybridization events, and something I did not say. So the top row is using the true gene trees as the data. And the bottom row is using sequences to estimate the gene trees. So the bottom row includes um, estimation error. So if you look at the, this bottom row, whoops, you will see that this white bar, the proportion of times that we are reconstructing the true network with direction of hybrid edges, it's, it's decreasing. It's actually, it's getting worse as I have more genes. So that was very weird. So we, at first we got very disappointed, but then we looked and it turns out that we are reconstructing the correct unrooted network topology. So the thing that we're missing, and this is in light, light beige that I'm pointing here. So this is the, the one in the middle. So we, we know that the cycle is there, but we cannot detect the correct direction of the hybrid edges. It's just like saying, I know the cycle is there, but I don't know who is the hybrid node in this cycle. So it was not that terrible. So we thought that we were reconstructing a completely different wrong network, but that's not true. 
So it turns out that most of the time or all the time, we were reconstructing the correct unrooted network topology, but we had trouble with the edges, the, the direction of the, of the edges. And this is what we found in practice. So this is what I was trying to say. So we find that, okay, this is a cycle and I'm drawing now the networks unrooted too. Um, so I have two networks here. If you ignore the direction of the edges of the arrows, so the two arrows, I should say, they represent the hybrid edges. So for the one on the left, the ancestor of A is the hybrid node. And for the one in the right, it is the ancestor of B, the one that is the hybrid node. So the, the unrooted network, if I ignore the direction of the edges, it is the same. So I have a cycle that is the same in these two networks but the hybrid node in this in the cycle is changing. Uh, we found that it is very difficult for the pseudo likelihood approach to distinguish between these two networks. So we will, which it is, I, I think it, it could be seen as bad news, but, but I, I, I want to see as the good news that we can detect the cycle. So we know who is involved in the hybridization. And we, um, with the pseudo likelihood, we might be able to say, okay, I cannot distinguish between these two, but now you use the likelihood method to distinguish between these two. So it's a, a, like a team effort, I want to say, because for the likelihood approach, it's very hard to even find what are the networks that, that, that could be good because it's that gigantic space. But the pseudo likelihood can allow you to choose the candidates. Okay, I cannot distinguish between these two anymore, but then you can use another method to, to distinguish between them. So I, I think it's not, it's not that terrible. And it turns out that actually, yes, these two, the two, the two larger networks that we're using for our simulations, they both have uh, these diamonds. Uh, one thing that I did not say, sorry, is that we find this flat likelihood for the case of only four nodes in the cycle, which is weird. If you have more than four nodes in the cycle, you don't see this behavior anymore. You can detect the, the direction of the hybrid edges. But if there are only four, which we call this a diamond, if there are only four nodes in the cycle, we, we find this problem and then Yes, the two large networks that we use for our simulations, they both have a diamond in there, which is why they were so hard to, to reconstruct accurately the, the direction of the edges. Um, this, these findings in the simulation uh, motivated us to do some, some um, identifiability study. So we wanted to answer the question, can we detect the presence of hybridizations in level one networks? We focus on level one networks, which I will I will tell a little bit more about later. But these are networks where these hybridization cycles they don't intersect with each other. So we can focus on just one the, the detection of one hybridization cycle at a time. If there are other cycles in these triangles, we don't care about them. We can focus on just one because they are not they're not intersecting each other. Um, it turns out that to answer this question, can we detect the hybridization in the network, the answer is it depends on the number of nodes that you have in this cycle. So for example, if you have only two nodes in the cycle, this is the figure on the far left, you can never detect this cycle. It doesn't matter how much data you have, this cannot be detected. If you have three or four nodes in the cycle, then yes, you can detect it under certain conditions. You need to have certain number of taxa on these, these triangles, by the way, they are representing like a subnetwork. I'm not, I'm not drawing this, for example, N2 can have six leaves here. I'm not, I'm not drawing that part of the, of the graph. I'm just focusing on, on this, um, this cycle. Anyway, so if it has three or four nodes, we can detect this cycle under certain conditions. We need to have at least a certain number of, of, of species on the sub, the subnetwork. And if we have five or more nodes in the cycle, then yes, we can totally detect it. The presence and the direction of the hybrid edges. And uh, this is a result that I, I like to say that mathematically it's, it makes sense, but then biologically maybe not so much because if you have a really big cycle, then <clears throat> that means that you, the donor and recipient of gene flow are very far apart. Imagine like if it's a gigantic cycle, then they're very far in the, in the tree. Uh, which you don't expect to see um, a lot in, in, uh, in, in biology or in real life. You would expect hybrid hybridization or gene flow um, between species that are closely related to each other. So that would be 
cycles of two or, or three nodes. Um, these are the ones that you would expect to see more often in, in your data, but it turns out that these are the cycles that are harder to be detected with our method. But, but that's okay. I always think it's better to know what we can and cannot detect from data. Um, just to give you a, an idea of how we made these proofs, uh, how, how did we figure out whether we could detect cycles or not? Um, we, 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 we choose a network, for example, the one here on the left that has one cycle, and then we re remove the minor hybrid edge, that is the one that has a gamma, the probability is less than 0.5. So we have two hybrid edges pointing at the hybrid node. One is um, labeled by, by gamma or parameterized by gamma, and the other by one minus gamma. Because gamma, well, it could be equal to 0.5, but it will likely be um, less than 0.5 so that one of the edges is considered the minor edge, the one that has a probability of less than 0.5, and the other one is considered the major edge that has a probability greater than 0.5. Anyway, so we have this network. We um, assume that there is the gamma is not equal to 0.5 so that we can remove the minor edge. And I'm drawing this, the tree here on the right. It is the same underlying tree as the network, except that it does not have the minor hybrid edge. So I remove that edge from here. And also remove these nodes that have only two edges. These nodes, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're just to make the tree binary. So I remove these um, minor hybrid edge, and then, then both the network and the tree, they produce a system of equations for the expected concordance factors. So the formulas that I, that I very briefly show you um, from the coalescent model, the network defines a set of equations for the concordance factors, and the, the tree also pro, um, defines a set of equations for its concordance factors. And then the question is whether these two systems have the same solution, can share a solution. Because if that is true, if both the network and the tree can have the same set of concordance factors, that means that we cannot detect it with the concordance factors. So we were asking the question of whether the, both the network and the tree could share the same system of, of concordance factors. And we found conditions under the, which they, they can't. And here, I, I only put this figure just to point at these other archives. So the original proofs are on the, oh, the, the, the SNAG paper. This is the 2016, the plus genetics paper. You will find um, the proofs of identifiability there, but more for biological audience, not, not so much for mathematical audience. If you are more, mathematically inclined, uh, we regrow them, the proofs on the 2020 archive paper. So you can check that one out and um, you will find uh, under which conditions the network and the tree do not share solutions anymore. Okay, so in theory, yes, we can detect the presence of, of the diamond in this case um, under certain conditions on, on the taxa, but it turns out that in practice, sometimes we can't, right? And because the, the theory, uh, assumes that you have perfect data, not, not noise, not estimation error, you know, that you have sufficiently large data sets, that is the theoretical, the, the perfect world. But in practice, because the, our data is noisy, because we have estimation error, perhaps we don't have as large data sets as we would want, then we cannot really uh, detect this type of, um, which is the direction of the hybrid nodes for the, for the diamond. And one thing that I like to, to, to tell people, I, I feel that there is not enough um, studies of identifiability in the space of networks. And I think that it's really important, even if you just want to estimate a network, if, it, if you're not a mathematician, and it, it's also, it should also matter to you because it, it informs uh, how much data you really need. And I will tell you just this example. So we simulated data on the, this network on um, the left that has two diamonds in orange and red. And one, we call it a good diamond, and the other one, we call it a bad diamond, and, and you will see why in a second. On the figure here on the right, I'm measuring the proportion of the times that I correctly detect the hybrid. So the, the presence of the cycle and the direction of the hybrid edge as a function of the number of genes that I have in my sample. So if I want to um, reconstruct the good diamond, uh, I need as little as 30 genes to, to find the cycle and the direction of the hybrid edges. But if I want to know that the blood diamond is there, the bad diamond is there, I need at least 3,000 genes. So there is this difference from 30 to 3,000 genes. 
And this is a characteristic not on the data. This is a characteristic of the network. There are some types of hybridization events that are harder to be detected because of their model, because of the coalescent model. So just knowing which ones those are will allow us to know how much data we actually need, or at least have a ballpark of whether we need dozens of, of genes or we need thousands of genes to reconstruct the hybridization of interest. Okay. And uh, I wanted to also tell a little bit about um, the optimization details that we do in SNAC for it to, to be scalable. Uh, we, we do remove at every step. So SNAC, I didn't mention this, but we are searching the space of network with certain moves. And at every step, we remove hybridizations that if the, um, the gamma or the inheritance probability is estimated to be very close to zero, then we think, okay, this edge should not be here. So we remove them. And also, if there are three edges that are very close, estimated, the branch length is estimated to be very close to zero, then we take that as evidence as, okay, this is not the correct rearrangement. So we try to do an NNI move around this. And then to navigate network space, we basically have these five types of moves. So we add hybridizations. We, we have an, a maximum number of hybridizations allowed because we don't impose any penalty. And one thing that we, we already know from likelihood is that uh, a model that is more complex will always fit the data better. So we need to, because we don't penalize by the number of parameters, a network with more hybridizations will always fit the data better than a network with less hybridization. So in our case within SNAC, the, the way to control for this over parameterization is to have a maximum for the number of hybridization. But there is still a lot of room for, um, for doing model selection tools in the space in the case of network. Um, we among the network moves, we also um, change direction of hybrid edges. If we have a hybrid edge, we move the origin or we move the target of it, and then we do standard tree moves. And I just want to highlight that these are moves that have already been uh, also published for rooted uh, rooted networks um, as well. Okay. So uh, I wanted, like I said, my talk, uh, this is focused up until this point, it has been just focusing on SNAC, but really reconstructing networks is challenging, uh, regardless of the method that you're using. And I just wanted to highlight by, um, by the end, uh, what are the main challenges that I see in the field and then um, that it applies to any network method. And the first one is the identifiability that I just started to describe with, with SNAC. This identifiability problem really goes beyond the pseudo likelihood. You could be thinking, well, if we use the true likelihood, maybe we don't have the identifiability problem. Well, I think we do have it, but we, we still have not explored the likelihood or studied the identifiability of the likelihood very, very well. Uh, there's still so much work to do. I do still believe that some identifiability challenges in the pseudo likelihood would remain with the likelihood. This is just my, my gut feeling. Uh, we have not done this study. And for sure, there will be cases that cannot be identified with the pseudo likelihood that can be identified with the likelihood. So in either case, um, we were not the first to talk about identifiability of networks. So this is a very interesting paper by uh, the Selims Cornabaca and Fabio Pardi uh, on the distinguishability of networks. And they use a criteria of display trees. So they are not using the coalescent model or the gene trees uh, to, to define a likelihood. In their approach, they have a collection of trees here labeled T1, T2, T3. Uh, there are the displayed trees of a network. And the question is, from the displayed trees, can I get what the network was? And I have not told you what, what a displayed tree is. So if we focus here on N1, for example, there is a hybridization just above B because there are two edges leading to B. So a uh, displayed tree is a tree where you turn off or remove one of the hybrid edges for all of the hybridization events that are involved. So maybe it might be easier from one of my other figures. So for example, in this network here, I'm, I'm focusing on the one in the left, you ha we have two hybrid nodes, uh, hybrid edges, sorry, drawn by the arrows. So the displayed tree is the one that we get from removing one of the edges first and then removing the other one. So you will get two trees per hybridization event. Okay, 
And if there are many, of course, then there's all this combination depending on which one, which branch you remove. So in their, in their paper, they wanted to ask the question, if I give you the set of displayed trees, can you know which is the network they came from? And they found that the answer is no sometimes. It's yes for level one networks where the cycles don't intersect, but if it's not a level one network, then you cannot. So in this case, um, well, you cannot sometimes. So here they show that, for example, these two networks, N1 and N2, they have this exact same set of display trees. So if I just give you the display trees, you cannot distinguish if it is N1 or N2. So the solution that they came up with is, let's use what they call a canonical network or an unzip network. So we don't know what is the order of the hybridization events that lead to B. So I'm just gonna put them all at the same time. So you see there are three branches leading to B. This is the canonical network now. So instead of reconstructing the exact order of hybridization events, I just know that there was a hybridization above uh, B, but I don't know what the order was. And I like to think the, of this kind of like a reverse polytomy. It's, it's the same idea where we don't have sufficient data to know the order of the speciation events. So we just put a polytomy because we don't know exactly the order. Uh, in this case, it's the same. So we don't have enough the order of hybridization events. So we put this reverse polytomy. I know it's not a polytomy, but we just put all the hybrid edges at the same, at the same node. And this is the canonical network. But one thing to notice again, is that they're not using the likelihood model. They're not using the multi-species coalescent model to, to study identifiability. They're using a different criteria, which is just the set of displayed trees. If I give you the set, can you give me the network? And there was a follow-up to this paper by James Degnans and, 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 study, and his, his um, student, where they say that actually these two networks, N1 and N2, they are distinguishable under the multi-species coalescent model. So if you account for the variability of the gene trees, you can distinguish between them. And the, the, the trick is that the gene trees will not necessarily be a displayed tree because of the um, incomplete linear sorting. So you can end up with gene trees there are none of the displayed trees, and that give you more information. So if you account for that variability on the, the multi-species coalescent model, you can distinguish between these two, these two networks. But that does not mean that you can distinguish from any network. But one, one interesting thing that, that they, they discuss in this paper by James is this idea of parental trees, not just displayed trees. So the parental trees, um, they account for different coalescent events or not coalescing events. So for example, if they focus on this uh, network on top, this W network, we have this clade B and C. So if I have a lineage from B and C, then they have this branch in the middle where they can coalesce. So with some probability, B and C will coalesce, and then I will get the figure here on the left where I, I replaced the clade B and C with just one tip, B and C because they coalesced, yes? So they coalesce and they're just only one. Or maybe they don't coalesce in this window and then they both reach the hybrid node. So then that's what's happened on the figure on the right. So B and C, they reach the hybrid node and they didn't coalesce. So then you decompose the network by probabilities of whether certain clades coalesce or do not coalesce. And then at the end, you end up with a collection of trees that are, it's a bigger set than the displayed trees because it accounts for different gene trees not um, coalescing on, on certain windows where they have to. Anyway, so what they claim is that a better representation of the network can be done through parental trees, not just the displayed trees because they account for the multi-species coalescing process. Okay. So many challenges on identifiability, the, the notion of display versus parental trees. Uh, one thing that I that I you might be seeing in my slide and I have ignoring. So in Snack, we reconstruct level one. I told you the, the cycles could not intersect each other. And we also reconstruct semi-directed networks. So we, we don't take the root into account for the red network. Uh, you can root them at the end with an outgroup, just like we do with trees. And then we found certain hybridizations that are faster to be reconstructed or that are easier to be reconstructed than, than others. So we think that there, that there, there is value in studying 
um, subsets of the network as opposed to just can you reconstruct the whole network um, accurately. There's still a lot of work to do um, in terms of the likelihood and then extending to other types of, of networks. Now, there are other challenges. As I told you, we want to navigate network space. Uh, we, um, there are certain moves. So we start somewhere and then we, we change, we change, we change until, until we think we find the maximum pseudo likelihood or the maximum likelihood. Um, it turns out that we, we would like to have more guarantees about the traversal in this network space um, because we want to know that it doesn't matter where we start, we will be able to reach whatever point that the space is connected with our moves. And there are some guarantees of connectivity, but some of these proofs, um, the, the path from one network to another network, it goes, um, you have to remove hybridizations and then traverse on tree space and then add hybridization back, which is, um, I think it's, 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 it's good to know that, that it is connected, but the problem is that if you're doing likelihood search, uh, you will never accept moves that remove hybridizations because, like I said um, in, in another slide, a network with more hybridizations will always feed the data better. So if you're traversing the space, you're trying to find this, the, the spot with higher likelihood, so you will reject moves that decrease the likelihood. And those are the ones where you will move hybridization. Better. Anyway, so there's still more work to do on the connectivity of network space. And then lastly, simple things as just how do we compare if two networks are the same? Um, well, we still don't have a distance function that we all agree on. Uh, on the case of trees, we all use Robinson pools. So we use the, the network's distances, uh, no, not networks, the move, the, the distances based on the move. Uh, for the case of networks, uh, there are distances that are, are only distances for a subclass of networks, not for every single network. And many of the cases, they need a root. So for example, one that is very widely used is the hardwired cluster distance that compares the clades created by a network, uh, but it's also it's only for rooted networks. And um, so currently, we want better ways to summarize collections of networks and to compare, compare different networks. So one thing that we do in fallow networks is we quantify proportions of times that we see different clades um, how many times certain clades represent the hybrid clades. And this is, uh, for example, in this was one example where we did uh, bootstrap of networks. And then we found, I'm just going to focus on the figure in the middle. We found that the clade A was the hybrid clade. So that was the recipient of, of the gene flow 33% of the time. But there was actually another clade, this one, the OE clade that was a hybrid 44% uh, of the time. So actually it was, it was a higher proportion. So in, in SNAG, we, are, we quantify when we do bootstrap, we can do bootstrap and when we do bootstrap, the way that in which we summarize the network information is by focusing on how many times certain clades are the hybrid clade or the major sister clade or the minor sister clade. And I mentioned this and it might sound very obvious, but uh, Summarizing bootstrap of, of trees is very straightforward because you just focus on edges and then the edge creates a split and then you just quantify how many times you have the split. But we don't have the split notion in networks anymore because same edges, different edges can have the same split. So we have to come up with other ways to summarize the information. And this is one thing that we do in file networks. We focus on specific clades and how often they are, they are clades. Okay. And then so just like a, to, to to finish, and I think I'm, I'm running out of time, so I will just give you a quick advertisement again of Fire Networks. This is a Julia package um, that has a snack is one of the functions, but we have many other functions in there to manipulate networks, plot them, uh, even do comparative methods for continuous trade evolution. And we have an online documentation and a Google user group. And this is Cecilia Neck here that um, was, was the lead um, um, author also on this, on this work. Uh, lead collaborator on this work. And okay, I, I thought I would have more time to tell you about what is happening right now. So this is what we have up until this point. I will tell you just very briefly that we are still working on making snack faster because um, we we I show you it is really is it is faster than Falonet and and this too, but is it really fast? And it's not really fast if we have really gigantic networks. 
So we, well, if you have really gigantic networks, nothing can, you, you cannot use anything. But for example, in this case, we were testing um, 10, N represents the number of species. So we were testing 10 and 20 species. I should say that the largest network that we have reconstructed has uh, 50 species. Uh, so if you were wondering what is the size of, that we are able to tackle, uh, I want to say 50, may, I, I have never tried one with hundreds. I would love to, maybe maybe with this improvement that we're doing would, would be doable. And, and by the way, this is work completely led by Tyler Chaffin. He's a postdoc who is jointly working with me and uh, with the Taylor Lab at CU Boulder. And what he has done is he has improved um, the speed up of, of SNAG by parallelizing the quartet likelihood computation um, by identifying the quartets that are not a good fit to the current network so that we do network moves to fix those outliers first. And also one thing that we're currently trying is we perhaps don't need to do all quartets. So SVD quartets, for example, is another quartet method that does not do all quartets. They just sample quartets and they just do a subset of them. Uh, in, in SNAG, we do all the quartets. So then we, we might be, uh, we, we're thinking that maybe using a sample of quartets could, could be good. The danger is always that when you take samples, you don't want to bias the inference depending on what is the sample that you took. So we are still exploring whether we can do this um, sampling of quartets in a safe in a safe manner. And the other thing that we're working on is to extend SNAG beyond the level one assumption. So here I show you one example on the right is a level one network. All the cycles are separate. Uh, on the left here, this is not a level one because if you see the two cycles, they have this edge in common, they, they share edges, they're intersecting. So we're trying to extend SNAG beyond, beyond level one network. And um, so that's, and, and I have currently positions in my lab to explore these if there are people interested in this work. Um, I, I have positions available to, 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 to work on networks, yeah. And then lastly, I wanted to tell you a, a little bit of other things that are happening in my lab. We're also exploring the connections with VHB space. If people have heard of this space, this is a, not a Euclidean space, but this is an attempt of having some form of Euclidean-ness uh, in tree space. So we project all of our trees into these ore plants uh, that are Euclidean. And then we treat them as just points in this space. Uh, we can calculate means, Frechet means, variances. We have uh, normality, asymptotics. So it's just, we are forgetting that we came from tree space and now we're living in this kind of Euclidean-ish space. And now here in this cloud of points, we can calculate averages and everything that we want. We are exploring connections between this VHV space and uh, the multi-species coalescent model. And another thing that, that we're, currently doing is we're testing whether we can estimate trees with neural networks. Um, basically, we're training neural network models with uh, sequences, and then the tree that they come from is just a label. And then we want to see whether if I give them a new sequence, they can predict what is the tree that they're coming from. And this work is motivated by, well, when we started this, uh, there was only one paper that had done it, which is this zoo paper. Um, 2020. It turns out that now there are like six or four, six or seven papers that are, that are doing this already. We're very slow. Um, but this was the first paper that we saw that motivated us, that found that you find more accuracy with this neural network model compared to standard uh, phylogenetic inference methods like uh, neighbor joining, maximum parsimony, and then likelihood of Bayesian. So they found better accuracy, especially for cases of long branch attraction. Uh, so we were motivated by this work to try to explore other architectures, and this is work led by Shen Wing Yang, a um, student in my lab. So um, that's the end of the phylogenetics uh, talk. I wanted to briefly mention that I'm also exploring microbiome work, but I'm not going to tell you anything about this. Just wanted to say, in case people are interested, most of the work that I do still is phylogenomics. That's the, the thing that I love. But by being in plant pathology, I'm being exposed to a lot of more microbiome work. So basically, just trying to understand how microbial communities uh, interact with each other and ultimately how these microbial communities affect plant phenotypes or, or even human phenotypes. Anyway, so there are two students in my lab currently developing tools for 
estimating microbial communities, how they are affected by the environment, and ultimately also how this microbial network affects a plant or, or a human. That's, um, that's the end of my talk. Sorry, I, I really wanted to be shorter than one hour to give time for questions, but let's, I, I'm happy to take any questions that you, that you might have now. Thank you. Uh, okay, so there's a question from the chat, I think. Oh, is someone reading them? I, I just saw it from, That's, from no, I, I was going to read them, but you are <laughs> me to it. So I'm going to let you keep going. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ed. Yeah, no, actually, yes. Yeah, so, so Ed asked if for the VHV space are branch length or gamma values for the edge uses. That's a great question. So for the VHV space, we are only living on the trees. So we don't have gammas. So we don't have a VHV space equivalent for networks. So the, so the only branch lengths are used. Excellent. Uh, so we do have some questions in the Q&A as well. Um, the first oh. one is, um, what are the minimal computational requirements to run SNAC? Yeah, so I guess well, that's that's a good question. So I think that you, I don't know. <laughs> so we, we, have be, we have been successful running it in every operating system. So we have, people have run it in Windows, in Linux, different, different Linux uh, operating systems and in Mac. Um, I think that it will also depend on your sample size or the data that you want to run because it will use RAM uh, memories. So if you're running something that is um, that is a really big uh, sample size, then you might need uh, more RAM um, memory. But I, I, I guess I guess I don't know if people can clarify a little bit more, but in computational requirements, I mean, I just we can use any operating system. And you just need to download Julia, which is not very um, heavy, like in, anyone can do that. And um, you just need to install the package within within Julia. And it doesn't have any outside dependencies or anything. So it should all be included in the in the package. So uh, yeah. I, I assume there would be a trade off if you have, you know, if you have less RAM and whatnot, it would just increase runtime to offset? Yes, 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 okay. yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Exactly. Right. Um, <clears throat> our next question: um, Can Snack take non-binary gene trees as input? Uh, for example, if you collapse unsupported edges in your gene trees, could it be helpful? For example, um, helpful for running for that running time or accuracy? I am having trouble reading today. I apologize. <laughs> no, no worries. Thanks, Seth. Uh Yes, so it can. It can definitely take non-binary gene trees. Whether it will help or not, so I I, I think it could help. With accuracy, if you really, if you, I, I, the, it always becomes somehow uh, greedy or how, how, how many of them you collapse. Because if you end up collapsing a lot, then you suddenly don't have any signal anymore. But if you are truly confident that that you are collapsing the ones that are just noise and where there's really no um, support for for those splits, then yeah, totally, it could it could help with the accuracy for sure. Yeah. All right. Um, next question starts with a comment. A very cool talk. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so the question is similar to Paul's uh, about how important uh, is the assumption of recombination-free loci. Um, what would be the disadvantage of estimating the concordance factors from SNPs directly rather than going via gene trees? Um, yes. So, so the recombination-free for, for the first question is is the recombination-free loci. It's very important because that's kind of like the foundation of the multi-species coalescent model. That the whatever region you're picking, it has a tree history. You can trace back the whole thing uh, up until the past. So if you if you think that there is recombination inside, then suddenly you the gene tree is not a good representation of that anymore. So it is actually quite important. But I I do know that th there has been some work that has explored how robust these methods are to recombination. And the good news is that they are robust when recombination is up to a certain degree. And I can share, um, if I have some time, I can share. Th there's a good paper by Lacey Knowles that tests whether the, um, the, the, the assumption of recombination can really break coalescent-based methods. And, and the answer, short answer is that many times it, it, it's OK. <laughs> if, even if it's recombination, the method is robust to that, but under certain conditions, obviously. And then for your second question, we do have methods to, uh, well, not myself, so actually Melissa Olavic developed this method that we, uh, estimates concordance factors from SNPs 
and actually that and that's out there. There's an R package that does this, and it's very good um, to do that. The disadvantage is always whether the noise. Uh, um, I mean, if if there are other sources of variability that could distort the, the what, what the concordance factor is meant to represent, I think that we still need to do more studies about about that. But but the method exists and it has been proven to work under under many conditions. So I will encourage you to check the paper for this Melissa Olave's paper on, on SNPs for concordance factors. Yeah, thank you. Right, excellent. Uh, so next, um, can your approach be used to infer network based um, on multiple gene data sets or a single gene data set? And how, does, how do your methods compare to methods not dependent on coalescence models? Uh, yes, thank you. So, so our method really needs multiple genes. So we cannot have a single gene uh, to re reconstruct the network because we, we use the signal on the multiple gene trees uh, to know where the, the hybridization should be placed. So we need to have multiple loci. And how do they compare to methods not depending on coalescent model? This is a great question. And I don't think we have tested this uh, at all. And it would be, I, I mean, this would be interesting, something that I could try. I have not, I have not tested. I've only compared them to other coalescent based methods to be fair, but it's a great, it's a great idea. So thank you. All right. Uh, so uh, looks like we have one last question here. Um, do you think it's a good idea for, uh, to subsample a lineage? Um, for example, with 100 species to only 20 or 30 uh, accessions representing the main clades and limit the discussion to only the, the deeper reticulation events. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great approach. That, that's something that people have done until we have sufficiently scalable network methods that will allow us to have 100 species or whatever number. This is what people have been doing. So they do subsets they and they choose the, the, the depth that they want to 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 choose to to find in reticulations. One thing that I should also mention here is that uh, we do account. So the the species we do account for the possibility of multiple alleles or multiple individuals within one species. So phylum networks has that that option, so that you don't if you have multiple individuals from different species, you only estimate reticulations uh, between the species, not not within the species level. Um, but then but then. This is something that I just remember from your question. But going back to your question, then yes, it's a it's a it's something that people do um, just to get this this sample. 